Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to this another webinar, Nature Writing for Children, brought to you by Azim Premji University, part of our Seeking Sustainability Initiative. You know, today we have a very special, uh, you know, when we, if you have seen our series in the past, we have covered a whole spectrum of, uh, you know, animals, right from elephants to the environmental history of India, to, you know, uh, to cockroaches, to insects, to what name it, dolphins, dugongs, and everyone in the whole wide spectrum that you can see. But, you know, typically when we think of animals, we think of jungles, we think of, you know, uh, nature parks, we think of, you know, wildlife sanctuaries. But there's something that is, there's a whole world, a universe of animals and creatures that lives and thrives right next to us. And the author today that we are going to talk to and the book that we are going to discuss is someone who has highlighted this, this, you know, proximity of, you know, life, wildlife buzzing around us through his works, through his book and, you know, uh, through his writings. So today we are very happy to have with us, you know, Sanjay Sodhi, who's the author of the book Critters Around Our Homes. Uh, he will, he, he has written this book, uh, you know, a couple of years back, but he's a Dharadun based naturalist uh, with keen interest on writing and photography. He's also a member of the Kalpurvich uh, Foundation. Uh, if you remember last time we had Pankaj Sekseria, who's also working with the Kalpurvich and he's also a founder trustee of the Titli Trust. So he has, he has written a whole wide spectrum on, you know, uh, Himalayan grassroots conservation, ecotourism, and, you know, he writes columns in newspapers and everyone. So we are very glad to have you on board, Sanjay. Thanks, uh, Shasu. My pleasure to be here and thanks to, uh, thanks to you all for inviting me to this uh, talk. Uh, I'm going to enjoy myself. Yeah. And, and, and also, the, uh, we are fortunate to also have with us Roshni Ravi, who is an educator interested in conversations between uh, that lie at the in intersection of nature, mental health and teacher learning. She works with the Nature Conservation Foundation and, you know, she, she, she's working on a very interesting nature classrooms project, which, which is trying to bring, uh, you know, nature based learning into our school curriculum and, you know, work with a lot of uh, educational institutions. So thank you so much, Roshni, for, you know, uh, you. coming on board and having a conversation with uh, Sanjay. Uh, just a small request to everyone on board who's watching this uh, show today. You can type in your questions into the live chat box. Hopefully towards the end of the show or somewhere in between, if Sanjay feels like, we'll, we'll pick them up and we'll post the queries to him and try to get his answers and responses to it. So with that, I would, uh, without much ado, you know, Roshni, the stage is yours. And thank you so much again. Thank you, Shashwan. Okay. Uh, hi and welcome everyone and uh, welcome Sanjay. Um, Thanks, I'd Sanjay. like to begin by actually asking uh, you what the inspiration uh, for this book was and what made you write uh, this. Uh, and before, uh, before I ask you that and hand over the mic to you, uh, everyone, this is the book. It's called Critters Around Our Homes and you can see the gorgeous illustrations and all the creatures that grace its cover. And um, it's really an invitation for all of us to notice the life around us um, in our immediate surroundings and to connect with the natural world, even just from our homes, uh, in the corners of our homes, from our windows and from our balconies. So, uh, Sanjay, what made you write this book? So, Roshni, the thing is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I live in Dehradun. Uh, we have a small, uh, small uh, garden in the back of our home. And as it so happened, uh, well, I got to Dehradun in 2008 and uh, late 2008. And at that point in time, uh, uh, I got contacted by somebody from Hindustan Times mm -hmm. saying that, uh, you know, would you like to, uh, we, you know, we are looking for somebody to write a uh, natural history series. So would you be willing to do it? So I said, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy writing. So uh, I'd be willing to do that. And they said, how often can you do it? I said, oh, I can do a weekly piece. They said, okay, great. Uh, and what do you write about? I said, what I see around me. I mean, you know. On... And I started writing that in 2008. And I continued writing that uh, that column for uh, something like 11 years, I think, or wow. 10 years. Every week. So more than 500 pieces. Mm -hmm. And I used to always write about what I'm seeing. 
I mean, you know, something I encountered in my garden and on my morning walk or on a bird watching session. Mm -hmm. And and you will not believe this that even today, I mean, uh, three days ago in my backyard, I saw a butterfly here that I had not recorded in my backyard. Wow. I mean, it's new record for my backyard. Mm -hmm. So on an ongoing basis, you know, nature keeps surprising you with all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point in time, I felt that, look, there's so much around our homes. If only we care to look. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've lived in, uh, I've lived in way, cities. Uh, I mean, I've lived in Jamshedpur, I've lived in Kanpur, Pune, uh, Gurgaon, Delhi. And I think the story is the same everywhere. It's not that I'm in Dehradun. So I may be a little more fortunate than other people, but mm -hmm. everywhere, if you look, you'll see stuff and you'll see nature doing some amazing things. Mm -hmm. And if you had to dig a little deeper, I mean, then there's amazing stories behind them. So when uh, Kalpravich actually, you know, asked for stories in terms of, you know, can people, if people are interested, I say, hey, this is something I'd love to do. I'd love to just open the world of what's in our backyard and in our homes for kids. So that's how this story, this book came about where, uh, and everyone liked the idea. Everyone said, hey man, that's great, you know, but do, will you have enough to write? I said, don't worry, <laughs> I have lots to write. I have no shortage of things to write. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's really how this book came about. Lovely. And I was just going to say that um, many may say that, uh, Sanjay, you're so lucky you live at the foothills of the Himalayas in Dehradun, uh, such a beautiful place. And that's what makes you spot so many things around. And thanks for also bringing in that you know, wherever we are in, whether in a city or a town or, you know, a small village, that there's so much to see around us. And Absolutely. I think Shashwat also mentioned that we often think of nature as something far away in forests, uh, but not in our backyards and, you know, in the four walls where we live. So, uh, you know, I have, I, I have friends in Delhi uh, mm -hmm. who after, you know, getting involved and talking, so they've got, like somebody has got a, a, a you know, curry leaf plant in their 15 story apartment or mm -hmm. you know a lime plant and they see mm -hmm. butterflies and they see cocoons and they see caterpillars mm -hmm. in the middle of delhi in an apartment building which is 15 stories high. so it's if it's there if yeah. you look it's there yeah. if you look yeah yeah exactly um and that's fascinating and i think a lot of people have started noticing things around them uh, especially in the recent past and oh in the last one and a half years a lot <laughs> of us have been cooped up at home thanks to COVID and the pandemic, and we've been inside. And um, so many people have reported, um, you know, uh, wonderful creatures visiting them and their homes. Um, how was the lockdown for you? What were some of the things that you saw? What were stories you heard from friends who were in, in other places? So, you know, I don't know about other people, but I can mm -hmm. share my personal experience, okay? Mm -hmm. And even, I mean, frankly, the lockdown mm -hmm. surprised me. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. And how did it surprise me? Look, I've been living in the same house now for 13 years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because there was a lockdown last year and even, even this year, mm -hmm. uh, I started doing something that I had not done before, which is rearing butterflies and moths. You know, typically, oh, okay. if you want to rear butterflies and moths, mm -hmm. you need to be around in your home and not mm -hmm. travel much. So, mm -hmm. you know, this was an ideal. So, mm -hmm. last year, I raised, I think, about uh, 40 species of butterflies and moths from my home and our society mm -hmm. I mean, not from outside all from within here mm -hmm. i also started setting up a, a light to watch moths in my house and i was amazed that i mean now i've been doing this uh, continuously i mean like i'm running a monitoring program in my home mm -hmm. and since june uh, i set up a you know a, a, a light to attract moths in my balcony and i've got 200 species in my home and I've recorded things that I have never seen before. Wow. So I'm just amazed that mm -hmm. even, you know, even in my home, I'm being surprised. Mm -hmm. so the fact yeah. is that they're all out there. It's just that we don't look at them closely mm -hmm. enough and we don't spend, we're not observant enough and so on and so forth. That's all. Yeah. This is fantastic, Sanjay. Did you write about this? Did you document this in some way? No, I haven't. I haven't written about <laughs> this. <laughs> oh, so uh, probably an idea for the next book. And we maybe, really maybe. look forward to that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, um, uh, Sanjay, tell us a little bit more about your uh, writing process. Um, they, and, and also what, like, how did you decide what to include? I mean, you just shared the number of species that you've seen, uh, right, in your... Um, in, in, just in your backyard. So um, the, obviously there were some limitations in the book. So how did you decide what to keep, what to leave out? And 
um, just generally also like tips for budding nature writers. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Roshni, the thing is that uh, the writing style, you know, I don't have any formal training. I'm, I'm an engineer by qualification. Mm -hmm. uh, my writing style has always been, uh, I write about my personal experiences more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost all my writing is about uh, something that I observed, uh, you know, and something uh, that I observed that, you know, piqued my curiosity. And then I went and read about it and tried to find out you know, why that bird is doing such and such and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. So most of my writing is experiential. I mean, whatever I've experienced. And uh, I also believe that, uh, you know, if, if my purpose, why I write is like, I want people to get involved and mm -hmm. get interested in nature. That's mm -hmm. that's the whole idea yeah. of, of why yeah. I write. Yeah. And in, that, in which case, the read should be an enjoyable read. It should not be mm -hmm. a lecture. It should not be mm -hmm. tons of information. It mm -hmm. should be fun. Mm -hmm. So it's one is experiential. I keep it as light as possible mm -hmm. and I try and make it as funny as possible. And I try mm -hmm. and relate it to, you know, incidents and happenings that, mm -hmm. you know, some political event that happened, <laughs> you know, stuff that people can relate to in their day to day lives. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that's really my writing style that for whether mm -hmm. it's for kids or for grown ups, that's mm -hmm. how I write. And I believe that's necessary because we are not trying to preach to the converted if you're you know the people who are already in love with nature is not the necessarily the audience that we want to reach out we want to reach out to people who don't necessarily have the the love for nature yet and mm -hmm. uh, this should be able to get them involved i mean that's the whole idea so an informal experiential mm -hmm. full of a little bit of fun and mm -hmm. some humor is mm -hmm. i would say mm -hmm. what i normally put into most of my writings <laughs> including whether it's chi kill children mm -hmm. or whether it's yeah, no, and um, that that comes across so um, kind of clearly in your writing, especially in this book. Um, one can see there is a kind of a conversational style, and you're talking about you know things as they are happening. Um, yeah. I also really liked how um, you've included interesting, fascinating facts about different creatures in each thread, and um, and it's a it's a it's put across in a way that doesn't make it boring. Uh, and right. Uh, right, and you've also included certain anecdotes, kind of local uh, things like uh, about the Kan Khajura and right. uh, about the Girgit. Um, right. So, so I mean, that's a nice mix uh, of uh, of content. So, how did you? Um, so, also, how like what was the research that went behind this? Um, was it all based on your experience or conversations? So actually, I didn't research this much because I had those 400, 500 articles and <laughs> to pull out from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so actually a lot of, uh, you know, the thing is that uh, I, I do research, uh, mm -hmm. do a little bit of research on, mm -hmm. on, you know, especially I think the research element comes in where I've seen, uh, you know, either uh, a lizard or a bird do something unusual and I don't know what mm -hmm. it is all about. Mm -hmm. Then I try and find out in terms of, hey, why is it doing what it's doing? Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of the things come out of, some of the research comes from that background, that if I uh, have an observation, natural history observation that I'm not familiar with, mm -hmm. then I try and find out as has it been recorded anywhere else and why was it doing why what it was doing. That's mm -hmm. one. And the second, this thing of, as you said, you know, uh, the Girgit and, uh, uh, you know, the Khan Kajura and other things. I think these are, I would say, stories that almost everyone in india would be familiar with you know in the sense that when you when you say khan kajura or you say ha ha yes yeah, I'm halum hai, I'm kumbuje, malum hai, you know that kind of reaction is there and that sort of pulls the person into the story so you know trying to uh, put in things that are uh, i would say common uh, should i say either urban or rural legends you know things like if the lizard falls in your milk you will die you know those kind of things are things that I have heard when I was a child, so it's not it's yeah. not that I didn't know about them. Yeah. But we do know that all of those, as I say, are quote unquote urban or rural legends, depending yeah. on where you come from. Yeah. All yeah. the things that are that pull people into the story because it's something they're already familiar with. Yeah. That's, the, I, that's yeah. Yeah. No, and that and those elements are fascinating because, uh, like you said, people can see their own uh, childhood or uh, stories that they've heard in in Correct. the book. Uh, right. while learning new uh, you know new facts and new new elements as well right. um, so um, also um, uh, Sanjit uh, the 
each of your stories are kind of uh, really uh, complemented so beautifully by stunning illustrations. I think uh, we lost Roshni there, but I think she was asking me about uh, the illustrations in the book. And uh, the fact is that, uh, frankly, uh, you know, critters around our home. I don't think the book would be uh, would be complete, and I think that a, a very large part of the the credit goes to the illustrator, uh, which is uh, Sushma Durve from Pune. And if you look at uh, if you look at the amount of effort, uh, the amount of detail that is there in in her illustrations, it is just incredible. And I think uh, uh, I think her sto- her illustrations are seventy or eighty percent of the book, and uh, it's what makes the book as nice as it is. And, uh, you know, some of the things that during the illustration uh, process that uh, I found very useful because it's something that I'm very particular about and she shares that was the eye for detail. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if the story is was based in, uh, say, in, in, in Pune uh, or in Maharashtra, then uh, we made an effort saying that the, the plants that we are illustrating need to be native species that are found in Pune. If it is in Dehradun, then we need to put in, you know, we've gone into looking at the little, little things and uh, trying to get those right. Uh, you know, uh, like if we have a, if you have a frog species that that frog should be found in the place that I'm talking about. And uh, so we've gone into, and she wanted that as well. I mean, she was mm-hmm. also saying, Sanjay, we must get this right. You know, we, I want to just take any plant or any flower, you know, I must get the right plant. I might, might must get the right species. And that's my view as well. You know, the way if you're doing it, most people may not realize it, but it needs to be as authentic as we can make mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, the illustrations are authentic. They're really, I don't know. I think uh, we spent more than eight months doing the illustrations, you know, wow. to and fro. And I used to tell her mm-hmm. what I want and she used to do it. And then we used to have mm-hmm. a discussion. So I think huge amount of credit goes to her for, uh, I think, a wonderful work. Uh, and uh, the amount of detail and and of course she's a great illustrator i mean that mm-hmm. is something that we've always known so it was it's incredible work yeah it's incredible work yeah no it's amazing how much context there is for each creature uh, can you hear me well, sorry there's a chardham chopper that's flying by so ah, okay um, so I, I was just saying that um, this, it's amazing how much context there is for each creature. And uh, and every time you open the book and go through it, uh, there's something new that you discover. So um, actually, I was wondering if maybe we could look at some of the pages together uh, and show that to the audience today as well. Uh, Shashwat, if you could bring up the PDF of the story for us. Yeah. Sanjay, would you like to take us through some of the yeah. creatures? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, you know, before I get into uh, uh, any single creature, uh, you had asked this question and I didn't answer it, which is how did we select? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, one of the things that, yeah, I think this is a better thing to put. So, mm-hmm. there's, there are lots of things on the cover, you know, there's a toad, there's a squirrel, there's a girgit, there's snails, there's the immigrant butterfly. And uh, so, one of the things that I said that this is an All India book. We have to pick things that are found that any child should be able to find uh, if he has a green space in his home, whether it's urban mm-hmm. or rural. So there's an effort made to try and pick things that are uh, found in most parts of in green spaces in India. Mm-hmm. So actually, we had a list that was maybe you know 25, 30 creatures that we listed, and then we narrowed it down. And obviously, there was an element in terms of, hey, do I have an interesting story Mm -hmm. to tell behind, Mm -hmm. you know, behind this subject? So that was really the the decision in terms of what to write about. Mm -hmm. We also had this huge debate about whether the book should be called Critters Around Our Homes or Critters In Our Homes. (laughs) And what's the definition? Because, you Mm -hmm. know, like cockroaches and things like that are inside Mm -hmm. the home. Some Mm -hmm. of these other things are outside. Mm-hmm. There's a huge debate and I said that, look, it really doesn't matter. As long as a person mm-hmm. can see this in and around his home, it shouldn't yeah. really, really, really matter. Yeah. So that's really the thought process that went into selecting the things that's uh, in the book. And Thanks on the- for uh, that, uh, Sanjay. I also wanted to comment on how uh, even 
everything that you've selected there's a nice representation you have some mammals you have some birds um you have insects you have spiders so you you and you have you have earthworms you have snails so uh, was that also a conscious choice to yeah sort of absolutely represent? i mean we you know i'm i'm like a huge fan of uh, you know uh lesser known uh, creatures mm -hmm. and uh, you know in fact i i speak quite vociferously about uh, against tiger tourism and you know uh. charismatic large faunal tourism and things like that where i think that you know a tiger you can only see when you go to the jungle mm -hmm. but a girgit or a snail or a you know but butterfly you can see in your garden and why shouldn't we be getting people interested in these things and every one of these has an amazing story to tell i mean it's not that the only the tiger has an amazing story to tell exactly right? yeah. every every creature on earth has an amazing story to tell so yes there was a very conscious effort that we need to cover mammals and we need to cover birds you know vertebrates and invertebrates everything should get mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. representation because we are talking of a wide range of coat and coat critters mm -hmm. uh, so there was a conscious effort to do that yeah mm -hmm. Lovely. Will you take us through the through some of the little wonders that you highlighted in your right, 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 yeah. right, right. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the you know this is actually one of my favorite creatures, and uh, you know there's a there's a small story that I have to tell, uh, which is uh, uh, I mean it's not I, it's not in there, but mm -hmm. when I was when I, I grew up in Jamshedpur in uh, uh, in small town. Mm -hmm. and uh, when i was very very young uh, i uh, uh, found a squirrel that had fallen out of its nest and uh, uh, that squirrel uh, i basically you know i didn't know i didn't know any different at that point in time and i took the squirrel in and uh, we called the squirrel mitsi mm -hmm. and for two years the squirrel was my pet she was inside the house for almost two and a half years i think and uh, there were occasions when we used to when the squirrel used to go outside but the squirrel she used to come back in and she used to be on my shoulder and she used to you know it's like uh, and i had a, i had a great time with the creature and then two and a half years after i had the squirrel in a home the squirrel went and nibbled at an electric wire in the house got electrocuted and died mm -hmm. and i was miserable okay mm -hmm. and that is probably the first time that as a child that i started thinking about uh, whether i had done the right thing mm -hmm. you know i may have getting getting the squirrel into my home as a pet may have given me a lot of pleasure mm -hmm. but was it the right thing for the squirrel mm -hmm. and later on and today when you know people ask me that mm -hmm. i have a squirrel that's fallen out of the nest what should i do i said just let it be let nature take its course Mm -hmm. but you know as a young kid i didn't know that uh -huh. so i've always had this affection for the squirrel in fact for uh, hindustan times the very first piece uh -huh. that i wrote was on a, was on a squirrel okay. so mm -hmm. i've had this uh, you know i always felt that the squirrel is what sort of uh, uh, gave me an awakening in terms of what nature should all be all about mm -hmm. and uh, hence uh, you know it, it's it's been something that i've been very very close to from the beginning mm. so i mean you know the the story about the squirrel itself was uh, uh, you know two things uh, number one the a fact that i wanted to highlight the fact that most people don't really know that you know we see the squirrel around our homes but actually what we are seeing across india is two different species mm -hmm. you know in in north india we have what is called the five striped palm squirrel and in uh, in peninsular india we have uh, the three striped palm squirrel and while looking at them they are, they may not be very similar uh, they very minor differences but the calls are very very different that means if, mm -hmm. if you actually use uh, you know uh, yeah, use your ears and you actually mm -hmm. listen to the calls they are they're so different the one in the, in south india very much sounds like a bird whereas mm -hmm. the one in north india has a very very different call so you know talking about that uh, in the piece was uh, nice you know introducing the fact that there's more than one squirrel and uh, you know talking about why the squirrel is called i'm i'm also very interested in etymology you know the the fact that uh, people don't know that squirrels are rodents and the fact that mm -hmm. uh, you know rodent comes from a latin word which means to, mm -hmm. to to nibble or to gnaw 
So I like to introduce elements of this in, you know, which I think even little kids will enjoy that. Oh, that's why it's called, you know, a, a Rodel, you know, because it nibbles <laughs> like that. So, and then uh, we also introduced, I also introduced this thing of the flying squirrel because uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating creature, you know, which it's it found, I mean, flying squirrels are found throughout India, South India, as well as uh, uh, in the Western Ghats and the Himalayas. So we introduced that into it because we felt that anyone who's going into a forest uh, and most of the flying squirrels are, are pretty large, so they're easy to see. Mm -hmm. So we introduced that into the story as well. And I do hope people liked it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was really what went into writing, uh, you know, writing the story. And then, of course, there's, I also like to put in folklore if I can. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, uh, you know, there's this legend that uh, the squirrel helped, uh, you know, there was a squirrel that was, uh, helping uh, Lord Ram build the bridge to Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and uh, it was carrying small stones. And somebody said that, you know, what help are you going to be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know how the squirrel responded by saying that at least I'm helping. And the fact mm -hmm. that Lord Ram was so happy that he rubbed mm -hmm. his hand along the squirrel, giving it the uh, the mm -hmm. stripes on its back. So mm -hmm. you know, stories like this are. I think many people would have heard this from their grandparents and things like that. And Putting them into the story helps people relate to that. Ha, ye maine bhi suna tha, meri dadi ne bola tha, or nahi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's the way the story was written. And then the mongoose mm -hmm. story. I think this is something that's uh, fun because uh, you know I I don't know in in my time I read I read a lot of Rudyard clip mm -hmm. clip uh, Kipling and I you know I love his stories. And the Jungle Book, of course, made it even more mm -hmm. famous. So a lot of kids relate to, mm -hmm. you know, they watch, watch Mowgli and they watch the Jungle Book. Everyone mm -hmm. knows about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the Riki TV, Riki Tiki TV story itself is there. And I think, it, at least in my time, it was there in my textbook. So I knew the story when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's there in textbooks today. But I felt I that, so. yeah, I think mm -hmm. people will relate, relate, relate to, the, you know, that story as well. And as you can see, so there's elements of that in the book, mm -hmm. and I think the the book is somewhere in the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the jungle book is there. I. Yeah. And uh, the fact is that uh, again, the mongoose is something that you can actually see almost everywhere. I mean, even in urban cities, you see, you can. I've seen you know mongoose in Delhi. I've seen it in Pune. It's there, and both the species are there in my backyard in Dehradun. So it's easy enough to see. Mm -hmm. I think almost every child would have seen a mongoose at some point in time or the other. Yeah. We've so recently nice. seen mongooses on a walk when we went yeah. with our dog, like in Bangalore city, but not yeah. like in the outskirts of Bangalore or anything. Yeah. I mean, because they're diurnal, they're easy to see as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. And they're not shy, you know, they're, they're mm -hmm. quite curious and they, uh, you know, that posture of, uh, I mean, actually this of, posture yeah. of the two squirrel, uh, <laughs> yeah. two mongooses is yeah. actually from a, book on i think the indian institute mm -hmm. of science bangalore where somebody mm -hmm. had a photograph of two of them standing up like that so that was the inspiration i said yeah mm -hmm. you, we must make it stand up in that manner <laughs> so Thanks. yeah i mean it's amazing how the illustrations also capture the behavior of yeah. um, of these different creatures as well right maybe we can look at one or two more any uh, specific ones sanjay something uh, a spread that you really like that you want uh, I, I think that uh, you know I like all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, my favorite, uh, my current topic nowadays, the thing that I spend most time on is butterflies and moths. Ah, okay. So I was very, very keen that I will introduce uh, you know an element of butterfly and moth watching into this. And uh, there's a there's a nice piece about uh, uh, the Atlas moth. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a nice piece about the silk moth uh, that uh, most people would have seen. And uh, a butterfly called uh, the, the 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 emigrant, which everyone has, uh, mm -hmm. you know, everyone has seen. It's that yellow or greenish white butterfly that mm -hmm. flies across in mm -hmm. large numbers. And the interesting thing is that you know that's why we we actually it, it's it's uh, it's so amazing that this butterfly is called the emigrant. Mm -hmm. It's called the emigrant because uh, it uh, undertakes uh, short distance migration. Uh, and you have mass emergences of this mm -hmm. seasonally. I mean, like in Dehradun, it happens in the month of June and July, mm -hmm. or sometimes July and August, and other places mm -hmm. happens in other seasons. But you'll see mm -hmm. hundreds of them, all of them flying in one direction. 
and you you still won't believe this that even though it's called the emigrant because of this short distance migration mm -hmm. it, the reasons uh, the ecological reason in terms of why it does this is still not understood i mean it's probably one of the most common butterflies in in uh, india but mm -hmm. we do not understand why they undertake this migration where hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them will be seen all flying in one direction mm -hmm. and many people say that oh because it's larval host plants and there's lots of explanation mm -hmm. hypothesis is given mm -hmm. but none of them convincing enough and we still don't understand why they do it mm -hmm. so the butterfly is named because of its short, short distance migration and we still don't understand mm -hmm. i mean there's so much we don't know <laughs> about the world of nature yeah yeah and it's um i'm amazed at how these questions and this curiosity has also kind of found its way uh, into your book uh, as well right um i i mean especially the interactive nature of uh, you know how you've written it and towards the end there's a little quiz uh you know that let uh, everyone check uh, how they've done and what they remember so um yeah how, how has um, have you read this or um, kind of shared this book with young readers what has been the response like what is the feedback like so i've done i've done a few online sessions and we've mm -hmm. done a few you know reading sessions with children as well and i think with almost everybody the the thing that i mean i've got good feedback mm -hmm. uh, and uh, i think the feedback that uh, is probably the most heartwarming for me is number one uh, everyone has loved the illustrations mm -hmm. and they say the illustrations bring the book to life which was the whole idea mm -hmm. and the second is that all, uh, most people said that the stories are very relatable mm -hmm. i mean like you know when we read it we felt that ha yaar ye to maine bhi suna tha you know that kind of thing Mm -hmm. so which was the whole idea right the whole idea was that we write about stuff that we write about new things but we also write about stuff that people can relate to and that even children can relate to mm -hmm. and uh, the the third element of uh, of uh, you know you, you mentioned this thing about the questions and stuff like that mm -hmm. so you know the thing that i feel is that uh, uh, the what natural history observation is all about asking questions Mm. you know and if you start asking questions the a completely new world opens up to you and uh, one of the things that uh, you know i do i do a lot of work uh, is with my ngo we do a lot of conservation education programs in whichever communities that we work with mm -hmm. and one of the things that uh, i had introduced there with the children it's something that i had just you know it was just mm -hmm. a something that i just said okay let's try this and it was such a huge hit that i use it everywhere <laughs> is i do something called the why walk mm. okay. so what is the why walk the why walk is that i take the kids out and we see something and uh, okay we see a butterfly and i tell them mm. the can you identify they identify the butterfly i say what's the butterfly doing it's mm. feeding so i say why so mm. everything that we observe in nature we ask why so why is it doing what is doing mm. why is it doing why is it sitting on a flower you know mm. why is it uh, sitting on moist soil oh so we ask it's a why walk whatever you see mm. you see a plant with the thorns you ask why mm -hmm. so and the kids just love it you know in the mm -hmm. sense that it opens up a completely new world for them and in to the extent that i mean this uh, uh, that whole training program was one series of why you know if i was making a presentation sir why sir why <laughs> you know but that's good you know the thing is that as soon as you start asking the questions then your curiosity uh, you know is what leads you to a new into a different world uh, into the world of nature Yeah, and not just for children. I think, um, I mean, as a grown-up, I would be uh, interested to go on a Y walk and learn. Yeah, yeah, it's good fun. I mean, I do with grown-ups as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the kids really take to it. Yeah, grown-ups, yeah. of course, yeah. uh, you know, have a yeah. different, uh, yeah. different kind of fish. But yeah. a lot yeah. of grown-ups enjoy it too, as well. Yeah, because it yeah. it opens their eyes to stuff they've not uh, thought about uh, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Sanjay, actually, I wanted to ask you this earlier as well. So. Um, in your work with children and with grown ups and also we probably have a lot of um uh, people watching right now who um are new and who are just beginning to connect and notice uh, nature around them so um what are some things that all of us can do to stay connected to keep noticing and to pay attention uh, to the natural world around us so i think a good way to do is do your own why walk na step mm -hmm. out into your balcony step out into your mm -hmm. garden Uh, and uh, look at stuff and ask saying hey why and then try and mm -hmm. find out you know you can go mm -hmm. 
you, today you know you have the benefit of just going ask you have a question you can go online and check i mean we mm -hmm. didn't when i was growing up we didn't have that luxury mm -hmm. but you do you can you can ask that question mm -hmm. so i think that you know the i think the thing of observation is that uh, uh, i often do this in my training programs is that uh, for one i think humans per se we are overly dependent on sight mm -hmm. so in many times when i take people out uh, you know like i go out into the garden and i say okay close your eyes mm -hmm. And and now we'll only use hearing and we'll use smell and we'll use touch and feel, mm -hmm. and then suddenly a new world opens up. Mm -hmm. Because typically what happens is we are only using our sight ninety eight percent of the time. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that we, if we number one, of course, we have to be more observant, right? Mm -hmm. And if we see things, and second, if we start using all our senses, you just suddenly find that there's a new world that is opening up around you. And to that, if you add this whole thing of why, hey, why is why is it doing this? Why is it doing this? I mean, then you have uh, the, the world opens up in front of you. Yeah, it must be fascinating. And um, I think I, I can imagine if you just go on a smell walk and uh, you know even try to just kind of distinguish different things in nature or in your neighborhood, yeah. the kind of smells that you just focus on, for example. Yes, um, I'm sure it can. Kind of bring up so many new uh, discoveries. You know, uh, the, and... Yeah, I have a story to relate as to when I said this hit me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I, I just said, "Oh my God!" Like this is like uh, completely mm -hmm. unreal. Which is in Uttarakhand, they have these. Uh, we have uh, the forest department organizes these spring bird festivals. Mm -hmm. So they are they are uh, bird festivals that happen annually in different locations. Every other location changes. So one of the years, I think almost five or six, seven years ago. Uh, it was being held in in the outskirts of Dehradun, and mm -hmm. uh, we normally take we organize uh, uh, bird watching sessions for uh, for schools. Mm -hmm. So one of the calls that uh, my wife Anchal got was uh, she mm -hmm. got a call from uh, this uh, the school which has uh, visually impaired uh, mm -hmm. children, and they said we want to come bird watching. So I mm -hmm. looked at my wife. I said they visually impaired. How do we take them mm -hmm. bird watching? She mm -hmm. said I don't know. Yeah, they've called us. They want to come. I said, mm -hmm. okay, I asked them to come. Mm -hmm. So me and uh, three of us, three of us who were, you know, doing the trails, we said, mm -hmm. man, how do we do this? You know, it was a new experience for us. And we said, okay, and, you know, we won't use binoculars. Mm -hmm. So we will rely on everything else. We'll, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they will have, we will ally, uh, rely on them listening to stuff. We'll make them touch and feel. Mm -hmm. And that walk that we did, which went on for about an hour and a half or two hours, was one of the most amazing experiences for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the kids also enjoyed it. You know, they were... Unlike, uh, I would say, uh, a child who did not have uh, any impairment, mm -hmm. they were able to get uh, uh, and identify birds through their calls almost immediately. That means if they heard a bird call, the mm -hmm. next time they heard it, they knew what bird it was because their, mm -hmm. their sense of hearing was much sharper than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kids who didn't have a handicap. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that they do that day in and day out. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and they live with it. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, that's when I said that, man, I think we're just not using... All our senses, mm -hmm. and we need to. And mm -hmm. uh, the fact that if they can do bird watching, then anyone can do bird watching. I mean, mm -hmm. it's uh, mm -hmm. so it was like an eye opener for me as well, saying that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think we just if we keep ourselves open and we keep ourselves mm -hmm. observant, we learn things, all, new things all the time. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that kind of learning experience. Um, that was you know that that was for you as well, and I think it also forces all of us to think how to make um, you know experiences in nature accessible. Uh, because there are, there is already so much to learn through all our senses and through our entire like body and our hands and feet. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for that anecdote as well, uh, Sanjay. Um, uh, Shashwat, is it possible for us to bring up the butterfly and the moth pages that uh, Sanjay mentioned? Okay, I think uh, I will have to do that otherwise oh, okay. because I think I've not sent it to him. Uh, okay. Maybe we can do that towards the end of. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. This session, uh, if there's time. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a kind of a reminder to everyone who's watching to type in your questions if you have any um, or any comments uh, from the conversation so far in the chat box, and we'll take them uh, one by one very soon. Um, so, Sanjay also mentioned um, your work with Titli Trust. Uh, and you've also written extensively, spoken extensively about uh, 
about the natural world and about your observations. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your other work uh, as well. So I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, as I mentioned to you that uh, I'm not uh, I'm not a scientist or my, my qualification is an engineer. In uh, 2008, uh, when I quit my job, one of the things that I didn't have any real idea what we were doing. You know, we were based in Pune. We were clear that both uh, me and my wife uh, and my son, we have a, we had a son who was in the seventh standard. Then all of us were in agreement. All of us are nature lovers. And I couldn't have done this if they were not supportive of it. But uh, we had all, we were all in agreement that we don't want to live in a big city. So we said, let's head for the hills. And when we got here, uh, I had no idea what I was going to do. I mean, you know, it was general, yeah, and, and that, you know, nature conservation, but that was about the extent of what we were going to do. And uh, at that point in time, when we spent time, uh, I, I spent almost a year, uh, you know, because I was already, a, we were both, uh, my wife and I, both of us were members of Kalpravik for a fairly long time. We had dialogues with a lot of people and then we tried to figure out what is it we want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the point in time that, uh, and everyone said that you come from a corporate background. So, you know, policy mm -hmm. and advocacy, great for you. Why don't you do that? And and the more and more I explored and I tried to figure out what, what we want to do, there were some things that became very clear. Number one is my uh, strength and my competence was in, an interest in natural history. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I can spend my time generating that interest in other people, I think, uh, you know, that's going to be an incentive for people to conserve because unless you get interested in nature, you there's no way you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to get involved in trying to conserve it. Mm -hmm. So we basically decided to do two or three things. Number one, we mm -hmm. said that uh, we are going to, uh, you know, work with forest dwelling communities mm -hmm. and we are going to get them to incentivize, con to incentivize conservation. So one of the major things that we do is we run conservation and livelihood programs in across the Himalayas. So Meghalaya, Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, we're starting to do work in Ladakh, Assam. And we work with forest dwelling communities and we tell them that we will help you get uh, nature-linked ecotourism going. And you in turn need to protect your natural resources. That's because it's in your, it's in your benefit. We have worked in something like about 15 different landscapes in the last uh, uh, decade. Most of them have been very successful where we've got an alternate source of income supplementary mm -hmm. income going for local communities yeah. and mm -hmm. they feel a pride in protecting their forests and the uh, and the uh, mm -hmm. denizens that live in them mm -hmm. so that's one thing we do we run conservation and livelihood programs the second thing we do a lot we do a lot of outreach and awareness so mm -hmm. i've written a lot of scientific papers i've written a lot of uh, natural history i mean lots of books for kids mm -hmm. uh, butterflies of uttarakhand Mm -hmm. uh, amphibians and reptiles of Uttarakhand, lots of moth mm -hmm. books, lots of butterfly books, which is a part of our, uh, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. effort to create, to document our mm -hmm. natural history and, and make people mm -hmm. aware of them. So, the so as a non-scientist, how did you make this transition and go on to write field guides uh, like this? It must have been quite a journey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is, you know, if, I mean, if my journey in this, in the world of natural history itself, uh, is uh, you know my parents tell me that uh, my grandparents uh, have an ancestral mm -hmm. home in Himachal Pradesh in Dalhousie. Mm -hmm. My parents tell me that when I was five years old, I I had a, a badminton racket that I had converted into a butterfly net, and I used to go around chasing butterflies oh. in the garden at the age of five. <laughs> so I think that inherent interest, mm -hmm. curiosity was there. Mm -hmm. But uh, my real journey actually into natural history began quite late. I mean, in mm -hmm. in college uh, there was a, a, a uh, a nature club mm -hmm. and uh, in my mid to uh, early 20s I went on my first so I used to go to the like I used to go to, to with my parents to Corbett and things like that mm -hmm. but that was about mm -hmm. it as a child mm -hmm. so in college then I actually got exposed to you know we I started off uh, we, I went on a bird watching trip with the nature club mm -hmm. and then I started off with bird watching and then after birds I got into butterflies and then I got into snakes and amphibians and lizards mm -hmm. and everything that moves Oh. And find, mm. I mean, my latest thing about a decade ago is moths. So, mm. you know, the thing is that there's that natural curiosity of wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm. I've never found the the lack of scientific, uh, you know, background as as a, mm -hmm. if you have interest and you're keen to learn, I don't think that's really a, a barrier. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've mm -hmm. described a new frog species. I've described a new moth species. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I write uh, technical articles without any without any issue. Mm-hmm. It's a matter of interest. I think if you're interested, mm-hmm. there's uh, there's just there's nothing that um, you know prevents you from from doing mm-hmm. this. I mean, look, all the books that were written in the by the British, uh, mm-hmm. you know, under, uh, mm-hmm. more than a hundred years ago, were not written by guys who were scientists. They were written by naturalists mm-hmm. who were interested. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the good things we can learn from them, right? Mm-hmm. That if you're interested, there's nothing that prevents you from uh, actually. getting into this uh, yeah. our natural world i think it's a great reminder and extremely encouraging to hear that and to know that 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 curiosity that innate curiosity and to want to find out more and to read and talk to people and just simply spend time uh, in nature observing uh, you know can take you uh, far yeah you know i I'll, i'll relate a story roshni where i gave mm-hmm. give this example to a number of people Mm-hmm. so uh, in nagaland for example uh, mm-hmm. we worked in a place called jizami where we were uh, helping a number of villages run a uh, nature education program for school mm-hmm. kids uh, uh, primarily as uh, in order to open awaken the community to protecting their own natural resources mm-hmm. so as part of that program there was a boy by the name of shekshalo naro who's mm-hmm. who's a 10th class pass he, that's all that's mm-hmm. his education okay mm-hmm. and he got so interested in butterflies that he over a period of 3 years he started documenting the butterflies of his village butterflies of mm-hmm. chizami mm-hmm. and in 2015 he published a paper called uh, butterflies of chizami which listed uh, 215 species the amazing thing about that and it was a scientific publication i helped him with it but all mm-hmm. the ground work field work and all most of it was done mm-hmm. by him that paper was uh, published in the journal of threatened taxa Mm-hmm. for two years in a row it was the most downloaded mm-hmm. paper on gott mm-hmm. it was the first paper on butterflies to be published in nagaland mm-hmm. after 1915 there was a britisher by the name of titler who had published mm-hmm. a paper in 1915 after that this young boy's uh, mm-hmm. paper uh, was uh, published mm-hmm. after 100 years he discovered two species that had not been seen for more than a century mm-hmm. and he's he's a 10th class village lad from nagaland Mm-hmm. I mean, I tell people that if he can do it, anyone can do it. I mean, you know, he had no formal training. He he mm-hmm. comes from a very remote village, but he was interested, and because he got mm-hmm. into it, and he's now known as the butterfly. He's known as the butterfly man of Nagaland. I mean, he's he's probably in his mid twenties or maybe twenty seven or twenty eight now. But you know, it's a matter of interest. So anyone can do it if you're interested. Okay, so I think we've we've lost uh, Roshni again. So I I want to give another I want to give another example, and this is uh, you know it shows as to how much uh, what interest in a person can do. So we, one of the other places where we ran a conservation and livelihood program is in a is in a place called Devil Sari, which is about eighty kilometers from Dehradun. And here there's a there's a young lad by the name of Kesar Singh, uh, who participated in one of our nature guide programs. and we were trying to do a nature linked uh, eco tourism startup there and uh, we did a training session for about 25 rural youth and one of these boys who came in was this chap called kesar singh and uh, we saw something in him where we felt he was curious and he was interested and uh, he got involved he started bird watching and uh, today he is uh, uh, he is uh, in garhwal he is the uh, he is number 2 i mean he is he is the, the he is number 2 on the ebird uh, you know where you submit your checklist for list mm-hmm. of birds he is number 2 on that mm-hmm. he's a better bird watcher than me in less than 4 years mm-hmm. this is a local rural youth people mm-hmm. said no 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 how can he do bird watching they won't be able to learn nothing he's keen and he's interested mm-hmm. and uh, he is sharper than me he spots more birds more birds quicker than i can he recognizes their calls and uh, he's uh, in garhwal he is uh, amongst the leading birders and he's a bird he's a nature guide now he does mm-hmm. he, he, he you know people uh, take him for bird watching and and stuff like that so it's a matter of that you know a boy from nagaland a boy from uttarakhand it doesn't matter it's if you are interested you can get into the natural history world and i think the one constant between all these people is they continue to learn and they continue mm-hmm. to explore that's really the yeah the yeah. key yeah Yeah, lovely. Thank you so much, Sanjay, for sharing both of these extremely, I think, inspiring stories. Um, and uh, um, 
how do you i mean how do you consciously uh, make these connections how do you um, is this part of the titli trust program how does this tell us a little bit more about uh, yeah, how so, you foster you know, these I, relationships yeah so you know i mentioned this thing that you know we do conservation livelihood programs we do uh, awareness and outreach mm-hmm. the other thing that we are very heavily into is citizen science mm-hmm. and uh, one of the things that uh, you know uh, where we make a conscious effort that not just urban people but even uh, uh, people from uh, like kesar singh from uh, uh, you know from devalsari or uh, chacholo naro from nagaland that they are also involved in contributing to conservation on an ongoing basis so for example uh, if uh, kesar is uh, you know contributes his data and his information regularly on ebird which is a citizen science platform and uh, chacholo naro uh, contributes his images to the butterflies of india website which is again another citizen science platform for uh, so and a lot of the rural places uh, forest dwelling communities that we involve people we encourage the local youth to actually get involved and contribute because you know for them also it's a sense of pride ki they see their village's name coming up on a on a on a national or a international level website and their name is displayed there their copyright is there it's, so it's a great deal of pride for them that uh, they are able to contribute to conservation starting mm-hmm. sitting in their village which is mm-hmm. it can be anywhere in the country mm-hmm. so i think the citizen you know involving rural youth and forest dwelling communities and citizen science programs is a great way to make them involved even when we are not there you know the mm-hmm. thing is that with a very remote location i can go there only a few times in a year but through this uh, through this mechanism we try and ensure that they are constantly involved and involved and they evolve their own efforts for conservation through citizen science platforms so there's a lot of time we spend uh, doing that you know getting people involved in citizen science fantastic um we have two questions from the audience so perhaps we can take them uh, now uh the first one is from vijeta and she says during the covid pandemic it is said that nature recovered from all the negative impact of humans what do you think about that yeah i've heard this i've heard a lot of other people say this uh frankly uh, my own view is that uh, i'm not entirely sure uh, whether that really happened i think a large mm-hmm. amount of evidence is anecdotal evidence you know i don't think we have any data to back up this finding that nature has come back uh, because uh, of uh, covid what is of course clear is that you know if there is if there's lower amount of if there are low people on the streets and there's a lower amount of pollution there's low lo- lower number of uh, vehicles and so on and so forth mm-hmm. obviously that will have a positive impact on the on uh, on the environment as well as uh, on nature i mean if there's less pollution it's better for the the natural world mm-hmm. per se mm-hmm. but if you ask me that did i see more butterflies uh, during covid in my garden did i see more birds during my walks D- in terms of numbers and species i don't think i don't really think so it may be because i was in dehradun and dehradun anyway is not as polluted as you know maybe in delhi the impact or in bangalore the impact may have been mm-hmm. greater mm-hmm. but not in our surroundings i did not really mm-hmm. see a, a, any significant impact of uh, people staying inside their homes uh, during covid mm-hmm. maybe different in other cities mm-hmm. okay and also perhaps we had some more time and attention that we were paying to things around us i guess thanks so that sanjay the next question is from dinesh chaturvedi and he says you stay in dehradun where there has been much impact on nature due to extensive destruction while the extinction of big species is spoken about do you see similar impact on critters around us oh absolutely i mean i think uh, uh, i think the impact on uh, on uh, you know uh, lesser known fauna the smaller critters is much greater than uh, you know a, a tiger or a elephant or a rhino you know what i call the charismatic mega fauna and the reason for that is that uh, you know if, if a tiger gets killed i mean ntca is looking over your shoulder if a, if a elephant gets killed it hits the headlines you can't hide it right Mm-hmm. whereas uh, with lesser known creatures there is a huge huge impact on uh, on uh, on account of uh, anthropogenic pressures i mean mm-hmm. in india we've had very few studies but uh, overseas for example 
there have been studies down in south uh, studies done in uh, in uh, south america which where people have been documenting insects for over 40 years mm -hmm. and uh, st uh, studies there show that the insect population has declined by between 60 to 70 percent mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and uh, and i am absolutely certain that that is uh, the same story in india for sure and uh, the mm -hmm. issue is that uh, we don't have data we don't have baseline data mm -hmm. so if somebody asks me that has ha, have insect population uh, decreased, I say I don't know. I say why don't you know? Because I don't know what mm. happened 40 years ago. You know we have no data, and uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, people uh, establishing. We are, I mean now there are a number of people who are doing it, trying to establish mm. baseline so that we know at least five years from now or ten years from now what's happening. But anecdotally, I feel the use of pesticides, the use of insecticides, pollution, mm. uh, habitat destruction. I mean. All of this forest fires, uh, mm -hmm. rampant road building uh, through mm -hmm. you know green habitats, all of this has uh, probably decimated uh, lesser known creatures. And I'm sure some of them have probably even gone extinct without us even knowing about them. I'm mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. certain that is, uh, that is true. Mm -hmm. So at a time like this, Sanjay, I, I think it's, um, I find it very interesting that in your book, uh, you've also included uh, creatures like cockroaches that often uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, evoke a very um, sort of a negative response from many of us, right? You know, even people who are ecologists or, you know, um, uh, there are a lot of people who do things like pest control. And uh, so what are, um, I mean, would you like to comment a little bit on that and uh, tell us also a little bit about what was the uh, decision behind including something like cockroaches and how fascinating they are. Uh, so the thing is that, you know, every creature on earth has a role to play. Right? Every single creature has a role to play. We may or may not be aware about what their role is and what their function is. And we may or may not be aware of uh, if they were to disappear from earth, what it would mean to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we, are, we put in, you know, things like millipedes and centipedes and cockroaches mm -hmm is uh, to make a point that every single creature has, you know, forget the fact that every creature has a right to live. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basic fundamental. It's not just us. They also have a right. Mm -hmm. But that apart, they also have a role in nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't uh, fully understand as to what their role is. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But uh, so the effort to put in stuff that people might say, eh, why is he put this here? <laughs> is basically from that point of view that to make people realize that everything has... Uh, mm -hmm. has has a role and uh, i think uh, the other element is that you know the fact that we need to learn to live with nature i mean mm -hmm. uh, you know like i i sit the window that uh, the table that i sit at uh, i have a window and uh, every year wasps come and build their nests over here and mm -hmm. uh, they have never bothered me and uh, mm -hmm. you know people tell me that they are there's, there's wasps near this i said no they never bothered me huh? i mean they don't mm -hmm. do anything to me I mean, mm -hmm. my, my parents, uh, just last week, they called me and they said, oh, there's a big beehive outside our home. Mm -hmm. What should we do? Mm -hmm. I said, just leave it. It's mm -hmm. doing nothing to you. I mean, no, they come into the house. I said, yeah, but if you just leave them alone, they mm -hmm. aren't going to come. They aren't going to sting you. Just leave them be. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that we need to learn to live with nature mm -hmm. is uh, one of the reasons why some of the other mm -hmm. creepy colonies were put into that. Yeah. That, that's something that yeah. all of us need to learn to live that. Yeah. live with everything that's around us. I mean, they have an mm -hmm. equal right and uh, they, have, they have an important role too. Mm -hmm. And also to have conversations about these, right? Yes. To uh, begin to notice them and to start talking about them because I know that um, perhaps for many people and maybe you've experienced this as well when you speak to people about, uh, you know, insects like cockroaches, the reaction is is mm -hmm. one of disgust. So yeah. how, do you, how do you engage, acknowledge and then kind of move forward uh, from there? Uh, we have to so move I don't think I've had conversations on cockroaches, but I've definitely had conversations uh -huh. on snakes, for example. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the thing is like, for example, in our society, when we shifted here, uh, I mean, the first response when people used to see a snake was to, was to kill it. Mm -hmm. And over the last decade or so, we've had con conversations within the society in terms of the fact that why they are actually our friends, what happens if you remove the snakes and Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, of course, the most impactful thing was that, you know, when I used to tell people the story that, look, there's a snake in your house, it's it's come because there's food. Mm 
mm-hmm. and uh, mostly rats. And if you remove the snake, what's going to happen is that rat population is going to go up and you're going to get more snakes three months down the line. Mm-hmm. So that made people think, saying, oh my mm-hmm. God. So now in our society, we are, we've been telling people that you need to learn to recognize the venomous snakes and mm-hmm. uh, and the rest of the snakes. And if, if it is a venomous snake, fine, you know, call an expert who will, you know, help mm-hmm. ensure that it doesn't uh, kill somebody. But for the rest, just leave them alone. Mm-hmm. And I think a number of people do that. I don't think anyone kills snakes in our society today. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. if you have conversations, as you rightly said, you know, whether mm-hmm. it's a cockroach or whether it's termites mm-hmm. or whether it's snakes, if you start to have conversations with people, I think everyone understands that, you know, they have their, they need to have their space. Mm-hmm. And also that we are the encroachers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, and that perspective takes, time to kind of also yes, build. It does, it does, yeah, it does. Yeah, definitely. We have two more questions from the audience, Sanjay. So okay. we'll just take those. Um, Suja is asking, how can schools contribute to understanding and preserving biodiversity? So I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been doing uh, quite nicely in many places is that, uh, you know, there are, I think almost every state in India has got these school eco club programs. Mm-hmm. And uh, the thing is that, uh, that's a very nice way to actually get kids introduced into the world of nature. Mm-hmm. But of course, these school eco clubs programs need to be uh, not textbooks, but they need you need to get the kids to experience it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I tell people that some really nice examples of, uh, of uh, school eco club programs is get the kids to create a butterfly garden in the mm-hmm. school. You know, just plant larval ho- plants, uh, larval host plants, and nectaring plants for butterflies and moths, and uh, let them get into rearing uh, caterpillars and seeing, you know, uh, a caterpillar. You know, the, if you get them involved in these kind of activities rather than books and theory, I mean, then a completely new world opens up. So the thing is that, uh, see, nature education, if it's not fun, mm-hmm. uh, it's a waste of time. I mean, mm-hmm. unless you're ensuring whether it's adults or kids, unless they're having fun, you know, only when they have fun will they get interested and they get, will they get involved. So you have to make the entire experience for the children, you know, not like it is today. I mean, today it's a subject mm-hmm. where many of them are studying uh, what e- I think e- e- uh, whatever the subject is called. EBS. 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 I mean, study. Yeah. So, I mean, that's like that's like for scoring marks. That doesn't make any. But if you get them ex- to experience it, mm-hmm. take them on nature walks, you know, mm-hmm. get them involved in activities which they can also do: butterfly garden, mm-hmm. rearing butterflies and moths, uh, mm-hmm. going bird watching in the campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, observing. I mean, we we were working with this village in Kiari in Pawalgarh, mm-hmm. and we told the kids that over a period of two months or three months, just look at the birds that you can find in your school and in mm-hmm. your village. And they produced such a nice booklet, which is called Birds of Kiari. They were like 40 common bird species. Oh, mm-hmm. And they, they illustrated, they painted, they illustrated uh, the mm-hmm. birds in their own fashion. It wasn't great mm-hmm. illustration. And they mm-hmm. hand wrote stories of uh, their experiences mm-hmm. with the bird over mm-hmm. a period of three months. And that booklet has come out so nicely, you cannot mm-hmm. imagine. Mm-hmm. that Things like this, you know, get them involved in activities that gets them to mm-hmm. appreciate. That's really the key. And let them have fun. I mean, if mm-hmm. they're not having fun, you know, it, it doesn't mean much. Yeah. Is there somewhere we can see some of this uh, work, uh, Sanjay? The the Birds of Carry booklet? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Let yeah. me. I don't know whether Maybe, I... Yeah, we can post it in the chat later yeah. on. Uh, yeah. If we can post it later on, I can email it to you for sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I if you have, okay. I can send it to, I can send it to Shashwap and he can circulate yes. it. It's a, it's a yes. PDF, so it's, you can yes. freely yes. circulate it. No issues at all. Yeah. So, we have another question from Hema Ramanathan uh, and they're asking, how do you increase observation skills? I can hardly distinguish birds <laughs> and bird calls. <laughs> so I think that, uh, you know, uh, this thing of uh, observation skills uh, uh, and moving observation skills to you know identification and things like that i mean this comes with practice mm-hmm. so and it comes with a practice and it comes with uh, having the right tools mm-hmm. so like if you're doing bird watching and you don't have binoculars it's going to be really tough for you mm-hmm. uh, if you are looking at uh, butterflies uh, and moths or snakes and you don't have a field guide book it's going to be a little tough i mean and when i mean Field guide book at your disposable when you're seeing it. 
you know, the thing is that if you see a if you see a butterfly in your garden and you can flip through a book and say, ah, yeah, this is it, this is it. That's when you will really, if you have to go back onto the internet and then mm -hmm. try and check it out, you know, it's it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the spot. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the toolkits are important in mm -hmm. terms of you know local information. We make a big effort to have local information on birds, mm -hmm. butterflies, moths, snakes, all mm -hmm. elements of nature. So you know, mm -hmm. and in local languages as well. So we do a lot of Hindi uh, documentation. I mean, we do a lot of uh, publishing in, in Hindi so that rural folks can actually recognize uh, what they can see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. information uh, available locally in different languages uh, is a must. In fact, uh, Critters is being translated into multiple languages and hopefully... Oh, lovely. I was just going to ask if it's... Yes. I think there's a plan to definitely do it in Hindi and uh, maybe some other languages. It's, I mean, works in... It's happening. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, I am going to do a bit of a plug for uh, a few other projects and my colleagues at NCF. They, okay. uh, there is a project called Early Bird okay. uh, that I'm sure you know of Sanjay yes. as well. Yes. Uh, and so Hema, perhaps that's one place you want to check out uh, uh, the Early Bird website and they have some nice resources for beginner birders uh, as well. So um, I think we don't have any more questions. Um, uh, Sanjay, I want to end uh, and by asking you what have been some of the creatures that, that have been visiting you uh, lately. Uh, what are things you've been observing in your garden? The season is changing. So yeah, what are the yeah. new things that you're seeing and what is it that you're expecting to see in the next few months? So I think uh, one thing that I have noticed uh, in the last uh, week or so is that uh, I think the number of butterflies, I mean, both species as well as uh, the uh, the count of butterflies, I think is, is higher than usual. Mm -hmm. And the fact that in the last week, I have actually seen two butterfly species that have not, is not on my, you know, my checklist of butterflies for my garden is about uh, 105. Wow. So I've added two species <laughs> to that in the last one week. So wow. I think I think it's uh, it's going to be a good uh, good season mm -hmm. for butterflying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that I can expand my checklist a little more. And uh, of course, the moths, the you know, the moth monitoring that I was doing at home continues to amaze me. I, I set up a moth screen at home three days ago and uh, I added uh, five species to my garden checklist. So uh, that is, seems to be an ongoing story. I mean, uh -huh. I, I, every time I set it up, I find something new. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. <laughs> it I'm continues sorry. to surprise me. Yeah. Is there a, a, a guide for butterflies and moths that you would recommend to beginners? Uh, so for butterflies, yes. Uh, depending on where you are from, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a uh, there there are lots of there are lots of guides that are available locally. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a book called Butterflies of Uttarakhand that I've done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a book by uh, uh, Dr. Krishnamay Kunte, which was released last year, which is Butterflies of Bangalore. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book on butterflies of Delhi. So mm -hmm. I think uh, butterflies, there's, uh, you know, locally, there's a lot of uh, information that is available mm -hmm. uh, in most uh, parts of India. And on moths, there's not much. Uh, there's a book by Dr. Shubhalakshmi, which has about 700 odd species, but mm -hmm. that's not enough. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not so much local information on moths at this point in mm -hmm. time. There's a moth website, which is called Moths of India. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a citizen science platform, which has got about 2,000 species. Mm -hmm. That's really the go-to platform for everybody for identifying Indian moths uh, today. Uh, so, and there's a field guide that I'm working on that's going to take maybe another six, eight months with about 1,500 common species. Oh, wow. But that's Lovely. some time away. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. And um, Sanjay, I also wanted to ask because you were talking also about identification, right? Uh, so, yeah. for beginners, um, how important do you think is is identification and um, if one is not able to ID something like Hema was also saying in terms of distinguishing between different birds and bird calls, what else can they observe? What else can they notice uh, other than trying to pin down a name to what they're uh, looking at? So the thing is, you know, I get asked this question many times. My wife asked me this. Why do you need to identify it? You know, mm -hmm. why do you? I mean, let it be. Okay, it's a butterfly. It's a very nice butterfly. Let it be. Like, mm -hmm. But the thing is that the reason why you need to be able to put a name to a species is mm -hmm. that, I mean, uh, not just from the pleasure of identification. You know, one is mm -hmm. I, I find that what gets most people hooked mm -hmm. is uh, 
I mean, that's how you begin. It's, it's like the first baby step that, oh, I identified, mm -hmm. I added a new butterfly or I added a new bird that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, that creates excitement in people. It does. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know whether it mm -hmm. should or not, but it does. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's just another hook to get people interested. Mm -hmm. If you can't identify it, mm -hmm. I mean, then you need to get into behavior. You know, you see a butterfly feeding on nectar and you say that why, on which flower, you know, this yellow butterfly that I see, it keeps coming mm -hmm. back to this flower, whereas the brown one that I see goes on to another flower. So mm -hmm. why, again, wh why is it going to that? And then mm -hmm. you, then if you, if you look at the butterfly closely, you will find that the brown one has got a long, uh, 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 you know, proboscis, which, mm -hmm. and hence it goes to a flower, which has got a long neck, whereas the other one has got a shorter proboscis, and you know. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that you can get into about nature without necessarily, I mean, just saying it's a squirrel or it's a butterfly can mm -hmm. allow you to still explore the world of nature by asking why. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's essential. Uh, so it's once again, it's just curiosity. Yeah. 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 Lovely. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Sanjay. Um, I think it's been it's been amazing and it's been delightful to have this conversation with you. Um, and I want to again show everyone the book that we kind of started talking about, uh, Critters Around Our Homes, um, published by Kalpa Rich. Uh, so Sanjay, where can they find this book um, if people want to get a hold of a hold yes, of so a copy? I, I think you can, you can, uh, you can uh, get onto the Kalpa Rich website and uh, I think you can uh, order it online. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can find the Kalpa Rich website. And if I can put it uh, uh, in the chat box. Lovely. Any last few words from you? Um, uh, okay, I may, I, maybe I'll send that later. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, I think, no, I think it's been, it's been amazing. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, thanks, uh, Roshni, for having this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's been good fun. Thanks to, to you know, APU for inviting mm -hmm. me to this. I've, uh, it's, it's been my pleasure and I've enjoyed every moment. I hope everyone else has too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if uh, people want to reach out to me, I can put my email ID, you know, if there are children mm -hmm. who want to write in or in nature lovers, more than happy if somebody gets in touch with me on my email ID, I've put that in the chat box. Uh, and feel free to write in to me. I'd be happy to, you know, many people ask us for suggestions for mm -hmm. getting into doing school programs and, uh, you know, how can we get the kids interested and we'll be happy to share whatever knowledge we have. We'll be happy to share. We have a lot of online information that is freely available. We've got presentations on birds, on butterflies, on moths in English and Hindi. We'll be happy to share all of that. I mean, it, it's meant for, uh, it's meant for people to use. We'll be uh, more than willing to do that. And the more people we can get involved and interested in nature, I think, uh, the better it will be for homo sapiens and uh, of course the natural world <laughs> fantastic thank you so much for that invitation to everyone sanjay so um i hope people do write in and share their uh, thoughts comments and questions um and uh, happy uh, nature watching and i hope everybody uh you know keeps looking out of their windows and their homes uh, and staying connected with the nature around them uh, thank you very much, Sanjay, for being here today Thanks. and for your time. And uh, lovely. Thanks so see much. See, Thanks see, so much. See, I hope to see. We, see, we hope to see everyone for the next session. Thank you.